Good afternoon, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Annie Carlano. I'm the Senior Curator of Craft, Design, and Fashion here at the Mint Museum and the curator of the exhibition Craft Across Continents that I hope you've seen or will see um, on the fourth floor. Um, we have a very, uh, very much of a time crunch today. So I'm going to move swiftly to introduce our very distinguished speaker today. And I see more people who've come from Washington and San Francisco and the Gertmans from Florida uh, joining us. There's some seats in the front. Barbara, if you want to come up. Um, so Joe Earl, what happened to the catalog? It, so our distinguished speaker today is one of the leading scholars of Japanese craft, very specifically ceramics and bamboo, and co-author of the book, Craft Across Continents. He wrote all of the entries for the Japanese objects, which are outstanding and a really fitting tribute to the collection that Lauren Lassiter and Gary Ferraro put together. I've known Joe for several years, met you over lobster in Maine with your wife, Charlotte. Um, he's the former head of the Department of Asia, Africa, and Oceania at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Before that, um, illustrious career at the Victorian Albert, after Boston, director of Japan Society in New York, and now head of Japanese art at Bonhams in London. He is going to share his knowledge and insights about Japanese craft with us today. Joe? Well, thank you very much. We have a, the space is at a premium today, so we'll, we'll crack on as fast as we can. I just want to say thank you to Annie and all other friends and colleagues at the Mint Museum, and of course to Lorne and Gary, because it's without the generosity of people Without the generos generosity of people like Lauren and Gary, Gary, this kind of event wouldn't happen, we wouldn't be here, and the exhibition wouldn't be on. And that's an important lesson I've learned from all my uh, experience of working in the United States. Private generosity is such an important thing in this country. Now I'm going to crack on, like I said, and as you probably know if you've been around the exhibition, the Japanese component of this beautifully installed Display divides almost 50-50 into works of bamboo and those in clay. And I'm guessing that many of you are a little bit familiar with contemporary Japanese ceramics, but you may not know as much about bamboo. It's a very recent field of collecting in this country and indeed anywhere else. And it's one where American collectors have played an almost existential role in supporting a tradition that at one point in the post-war era seemed like it was doomed to extinction. So I'm going to start with bamboo and take up a little bit of our time by tracing the history behind the extraordinary works of bamboo art on display in this building today. And looking over them just yesterday and again today, I was reminded of the tension between formality and informality, between a tight, highly structured style of plaiting or weaving and a still disciplined and highly skillful but much looser and a more irregular approach to the art of bamboo. It's a creative tension that's animated Japanese basketry for the last century and a half. For this is actually an art that is very, very old, but really very, very new. Although if you open a standard textbook about the history of bamboo in Japan, you'll see pictures of fragments of excavated baskets that are millennia old, but it wasn't really until only 1850, so just 150 and a little bit more years ago, that the first Japanese basket maker whose life and career unknown to us, first proudly signed his name underneath one of his works. And that signature, as well as sig signaling the desire to produce something that wasn't just a container for flowers, but also a creative work of art, that signature had another critical significance, for it marked a moment when Japanese bamboo artists or craftsmen stopped making imitations, even fakes one might say, of baskets from China, and started making baskets that had a distinctive Japanese character. Still, the emergence of an unmistakable Japanese style of bamboo was a, has been a slow process. The first Chikawinsai, not in the exhibition, but a very important figure, whose great-grandson is a leading 
a leading light of bamboo today. Uh, the first Chikawun site whose work we see here produced, among lots of other marvelous things, many masterpieces like this in a highly conservative, tightly woven style, most often made, in fact, from rattan rather than bamboo, uh, an imported creeper that's very important in Chinese basketry. And this one was shown at the famous Paris Art Deco exhibition in 1925, an event I'm sure familiar to many of you who are associated with this museum. And it's among the finest extant examples of his work. It's a, it's a family treasure only recently released into private hands and executed in his most meticulous manner and deploying a multitude of different techniques. It seems almost to be based on an ancient Chinese bronze shape and it was certainly inspired by a, a basket that he saw in, a, in an 18th century Japanese painting in Chinese style. This is, there's a lot of very uh, intense Japanese-Chinese exchange going on here. Nevertheless, this was a basket that was picked to be sent halfway across the world and represent the apogee of Japanese basketry. And as you can see, it even had its portrait taken, either when it left or when it came back. This is by a, a studio portrait photographer, a, a portrait photography studio in Osaka. And here, by the way, it's important to remember, we see the basket with flowers in it, something we have to keep in our mind's eye as we look through the rest of what I'm going to show you today. Now, Chikuunsai was from Osaka in western Honshu, Japan's main island, but his younger contemporary, Rokansai, easy name to remember, Rokansai, widely held to be the greatest bamboo artist of them all, uh, moved from his, with his family from an eastern prefecture to Tokyo in the early 20th century. And he's important not only as a maker, as a theorist, and his theories apply very much even to what we see in this exhibition today. Alongside his extraordinary and varied output, Rokansai is, is famous for a categorization of Japanese bamboo art. In Shin, that's formal, gyo, semi-formal, so, informal. Some of you may know that from flower arrangement. And he applied it to his own work. His Shin baskets, and this is one, Rokansai maintained, have an orderly form and are plated with such precision, sometimes proceeding, as I think you can guess from this little box, at no more than a few millimeters a day. They might want, one might wonder if they really are made from bamboo and rattan or not from something else. And in gyo baskets, the plaiting is freer but still relatively precise, while baskets of saw type are things of complete freedom that may at first sight appear totally disordered. And here is an extreme example. It's a small box exhibited in 1931. It looks like a labor of love, of course, and it was tremendously admired when it was put on view for the first time. We have the, we have the newspaper criticism, and it's universally positive. But it might come as a surprise to know that Rokansai once wrote of his early training, I hated bamboo. I hated bamboo. When I was very young, he wanted to be a painter, of course. It's easier. And he was in Tokyo. He was ex exposed to... You know, all, Tokyo is already a cosmopolitan city. He was exposed to every possible trend in contemporary art in the first and second decade of the 20th century. I, I was very young. It seemed to me like this bamboo, even if it had such a refined beauty, would never constitute a world that was full enough for me to, to make a mark on my soul. Nevertheless, he would later write, not so much later, it was after I turned 21 years old that I thought, all right, I'll create my own innovations within the world of bamboo. What matters most is raising this art form to an equal status with painting or sculpture. So that's the inspiration behind all of our makers in the exhibition today. They've all heard of Rokansai. They all revere him. So we don't have time to go into his career, but our first basket from the Lasseter Ferraro collection is by Kosuge Kogetsu, an artist of the post-Rokansai generation who was born into a bamboo lineage, and lineage is, has been very important in bamboo art, though that's uh, the situation that's changing today. And he was based in Eastern Japan, like Rokansai, and clearly influenced by him. His baskets are always recognizable due to the wide range of contrasting materials and techniques that he employed to create, he employs to create a single piece. But more than that, what really marks this work out for me is his application of shin formality to a basket that is at least 75% in a more relaxed, contemporary, lightweight style, 
both visually and literally, and above all in a Japanese technique. The bulk of the form here is executed in what's called senjo gumi, a thousand line or parallel line construction in which very thinly cut, ultra slender strips of bamboo are not woven or plaited in themselves, but held in place by other elements. In this case, two horizontal bands executing, executed in an elaborate embroidered technique. Significantly, I won't go on about Rokan Sai all the time, but you know, we have to keep him in mind. Uh, both the parallel line construction here and the embroidery, which you might recognize from the little box, were techniques introduced or developed by the master. And in this single basket, we see played out the struggle between formality and semi-formality, Chineseness in the overall vertical form, the tall handle and the complicated stitching and knotting, and then Japaneseness in the simple parallel line method, the, the contrast between tradition and, mater, and modernity. Now this move toward lightness of touch and transparency wasn't by any means confined to the Rokansai, the East and the Tokyo tradition. Age only five, the second Chikuunsai, the son of the man who made the basket that went to Paris, astonished his family with his capacity to execute beautiful, perfect plaiting. And it's interesting to reflect that his grandson, the present Chikuunsai, who's now in his early 50s, uh, one of his earliest memories is cutting his finger on the very, very sharp knife used to cut bamboo because he was introduced to the art form at the age of four or five and had a little accident, which he still remembers. The second Chikuunsai would, would go on to improve his skill in cutting these ultra slender strips of bamboo. You can hardly believe that is bamboo sometimes when you see it, and use them to create large scale works plaited in his own unique version of the hexagonal weave, which is the natural, part of the natural basic vocabulary of all basket weaving, east and west. This large example was a top prize winner at the Nitten, a very important national exhibition in 1952, and is a masterpiece in that new manner. But it's still recognizably a functional flower basket, and it would normally have housed an otoshi, a, a, a container, usually made from lacquer bamboo, lacquered bamboo that's filled with water and placed inside the cavity there in the center with a kenzan or a pin holder to secure the flowers in place. Are any of you familiar with the world of Ikebana? I'm sure some of you know about the kenzan and how important it is and, and how you have, you, have, you have the container but also you always have a separate, you, you have the, you know, a decorative vessel of some form, be it bamboo or ceramic, and very often in addition to that you have the water container. Now, in the early 18, 1950s, things were moving very fast in the world of bamboo. Not only were creative works of high artistry being produced in provincial centers that are previously focused on low-cost, mass-produced baskets, that's a, an important aspect of the sort of economic history of basketry after the war, but a handful of pioneers were pushing at the boundaries of the medium as a means of expression. And just as was happening a few years earlier in ceramics, questioning the assumption that the work of bamboo art had to be functional. A leader of this movement was Shono Shounsai from Oita Prefecture on the island of Kyushu, um, which is where many of the artists in the exhibition are active today. Uh, he later became the first bamboo artist to be named a living national treasure and rose to prominence in 1956 with this piece, so just four years after the one we've just seen, with his monumental work Doto, Angry Wave or Surging Wave, seen here on the left. This was shown again at the Nitten exhibition, and he made this piece actually in reaction to the fact that one of his standard basket forms had been rejected a few years earlier. So he's really saying we need to take this in a new direction. It's essentially sculptural in intent and was admired for its success in shattering existing, existing assumptions about the limitations of bamboo exploiting its flexibility and strength to create a powerful evocation of ocean waves. Shown here on the right, just to give you an idea of the, the flexibility uh, within the work of the, the early masters, uh, is another work by the same artist from 1956, but this is made for the very different context of a department store exhibition. And it shows that he continued to make straight on uh, flower baskets, albeit not really in his own style, but in the loose, very formal, very informal saw style, the grass style, 
that our old friend Rokansai again had pioneered 30 years earlier. This is a sort of, you could almost say it's a sort of Rokansai knockoff. So he's able to do both things at the same time. Now we come back to the Lassiter Ferraro collection. And this is a work by the son of the foregoing, Sean Otokuzo. Um, <clears throat> he majored in sculpture at Tokyo's Musashino Art University. This is an important change that uh, characterizes bamboo art and also ceramic art, uh, the change from pure workshop-based training to a wider formal art education. Returning to the family home, he apprenticed with his father for 10 years. But while his father had started to change direction away from sculptural bamboo towards much simpler works, his son, Tokuzo, seen here, continued to experiment with complex, complex form, sometimes incorporating pieces of wood or even stainless steel. In more recent years, he settled on the multi-layered style seen in this work, using bamboo split into wide strips that are bundled, bundled together at the base in a, a sort of complex structure like that, and gathered together again at the mouth, which the mouth his father always emphasized to him is the most important feature of a work of bamboo art, even when it's not a basket. It's a sort of, this is a, the, the work of Tokuzo, his sculptural works are, are very much there. They're bamboo containers that aren't containers anymore, but they still retain some characteristics of a container. And the rim is very, very important to the sort of aesthetic completeness of the piece. Still championing his father's early vision of bamboo art as a, as a dynamic sculptural medium, Tokuzo, we should also remember, follows him in his meticulous approach to harvesting, selecting, and processing bamboo. Most of it he does himself. He leaches oil and sugars out of each strip over a gas flame and leaves it outside until it takes on the clean, pure hue that characterizes his finished works. During this process, he may discard up to half of the pieces he originally harvested. So now, back again, and from here on more purely from the Lassiter Ferraro collection, Yamaguchi Ryuun is a near contemporary of the foregoing artist, Shono Tokuzo, and he worked briefly at an atelier run by Shono Shuunsai, the father, sort of father figure of um, Oita basketry. And he enjoyed access to the grand old man's workshop, seeing himself what was involved in the creation of a, of a large sculptural piece. Shown on the right here, again, not from the collection, but very important to bear in mind, is a representative example of his work in what we might call the Oita sculptural manner. But the small, meticulously finished piece on the left from the Lassiter Ferraro collection reminds us that alongside all this bold experimentation and rejection of practical function that characterizes much post-war Japanese creativity in, ba in bamboo, early approaches to the, the medium have not been forgotten. This is a piece that could have been made in the 19th century and it's executed just as well as it would have been in the 19th century. It's made from rattan again, as we, we discussed earlier, and it's Chinese, it's Chinese credentials, it's, it's uh, faithfulness to Chinese style is reinforced by the silk lining, which is embroidered with auspicious characters. You can see the Fu character up there that some of you may know. In this masterpiece from the Lassiter Ferraro collection, uh, we see the work of Katsushiro Soho, who was born in Tochigi, birthplace of Rokansai, there we go again. Um, and he watched, his, in his early years, he watched as his father, a farmer, wove practical baskets, and later studied under a master who encouraged him to free up his practice to create work that was aesthetically and technically more challenged. This basket, Named, if I'm not mistaken, Early Summer Wind in honor of a tour group, including Lorne and Gary, that visited the artist in 2018, was made from a species of mountain bamboo with especially thin stems. Using a procedure especially uh, favored in, uh, by artists in Tokyo and the surrounding prefectures, the artist hand cut the stems 
uh, split them in two, just in two, not into lots and lots and lots of pieces, and then beat them flat. You can see that, you can see the results of that in the strands on the side of the basket, not in the detail, but on the sides of the main basket there. He plaited them in bundle, te bundle technique when many pieces are plaited together at the same time, another rock and size speciality, using multiple strips stained in contrasting hues. The base is executed in hexagonal plaiting, surrounded by a foot ring entirely of thinly cut strips that were, that were laid on their sides and secured by bamboo knots, which you can't see terribly well, but if you look in the gallery, you'll, you'll see them. Then the ends of the strips project outwards and upwards to form the outer walls, and they're plaited near the top in freestyle twill plaiting. Some of them then twisted together to make a rim, while others form the handle. This is an incredible work of planning, as well as execution. The whole thing has to be thought out at the beginning, and it may be a matter of weeks or maybe even months before it's completed. So there's a lot of intellectual energy that goes in, and planning and, and geometry and architecture, if you like, that goes into the construction of these baskets. Viewing such a masterpiece of planning and execution, it's not difficult to understand why he too received the accolade of living national treasure in 2005. Also from Oita, Yufu Shohaku is another artist who started off making mass-produced items, but was spurred to move on to higher value-added, more creative flower baskets by a decline in, in the demand for tourist bamboo from people visiting the local hot spring resort of Beppu, where maybe some of you have been, uh, a change that really reflects the growing sophistication and affluence of Japanese society in the high-growth days of the 1970s. Since then, Yufu has developed a unique practice which involves irregular plaiting with other features, including carved bundles of 20 or more strips of flat strips, bamboo roots, and twisted rope-like forms, you can see at the bottom there and around the handle, in which broad elements are interwoven with narrower verticals in a simple one under, one over sequence. The thin strips and rope-like forms that are so characteristic of his mature style reflect great skill in preparing bamboo, for which he uses a simple knife and slices calms as much as seven feet long, all in one piece. Uh, he's the sort of he's a there's a lot of mastery in many of these baskets in the in the preparatory stages that we may not appreciate when we look at the finished work. And he is a master of bamboo splitting, both in terms of skill and in terms of speed. The complicated expressionist surface of cresting water seen here is secured on a disciplined core of conventional hexagonal plaiting, clearly visible in the basket's interior and on its underside. Have a look when you get in the gallery. Again, we see how traditional practice underpins the contemporary urge to individual creative ideation. Mimura Chikuho is a member of a generation of younger artists who've turned to bamboo after starting off in very different disciplines. Uh, in his case, classical music. He intended to be a trombonist, but returned from conservatory in Germany, preferring to do something that involved making things by hand. After a time working as a gardener and building bamboo fences, he gravitated again towards Oita in Beppu, uh, Beppu in Oita, sorry, where the Prefectural Bamboo Craft Training and Support Center has played such an incredible part in the revival of the craft in Japan. He then went on to train under Yufu Shohaku, whose work we just saw, and learned a novel style of make, uh, learning his novel style of making. But he soon began to move away from basket forms completely toward a more fully sculptural mode of expression. A close examination of this piece, which is called Moderato, reflecting his earlier career, reveals that despite its informal appearance, its structural stability depends on a regular disciplined core, which you can just see even here, of slender bamboo strips plaited in a basic hexagonal weave. Having created this secure base, Mimura interwove it with a random rhythmical pattern of wider strips of bamboo, creating the impression of a cascading mountain stream. Nagakura Kenichi, sadly no longer with us, uh, originally aspired to become a painter and experimented widely in different media before settling on bamboo as, his, as a material he prized for its contrarian springy quality that matched his own rebellious personality. In the year 2000, he became the first recipient 
of the Coatesen Bamboo Prize, named for Lloyd Coatesen, the former CEO of Neutrogena and a great patron of the arts. Uh, he established this prize to encourage younger artists and had it judged by an American rather than a, a Japanese jury using criteria that include not only technical accomplishment, but also sculptural vision and creativity. If you read um, jury assessments from the 1950s and the Nitten exhibition, they're almost all to do with technique and not really very much to do with creativity at all. And Lloyd Coatesen saw this as an obstacle to the survival of the craft and so deliberately set up this different way of judge, judging the work, especially of newcomers. Nagakura's artistic heroes were not the leaders of hereditary schools of basketry, but 20th century Euro European masters, such as Arp, Mancusi, Picasso, and Henry Moore. And apart from a short period learning bamboo technique from his grandfather, he was mostly self-taught and always worked quickly, sometimes to the accompaniment of recorded jazz, as I can re recall from a visit to him about 15 years ago. Using his chosen material in a free and expressive manner to create forms that can appear deliberately rough. Like other contemporary Japanese artists in both clay and bamboo, Nagakura struggled to break free of the tyranny of the utsuwa, the container, and make work that challenged received ideas about the nature of craft. Spinning, shown here, is a great example of his skill in creating a piece that's a complete work of abstract art, but takes as its starting point a classical so-called kikuzoko, a chrysanthemum base that you can see there, but it's on the side of the piece with radiating elements joined together <coughs> by thinner strands that are arranged in a spiral pattern. So he's created this sculpture by first of all forming the base of what might have been a basket and then moving on to create something totally different and the base isn't the base, it's the side. But he managed to include in the, in the piece a, a void to accommodate the otoshi. In this case, the photograph is taken with the otoshi in place, that lacquered, lacquered cylinder cut from a section of bamboo and used to hold water and flower stems. The persistence of vessel form in his work, but now on a larger scale, is apparent on the right in this work from another private collection, almost six feet tall. It was constructed all by splitting all but the last inch or two of a length of bamboo into numerous fine strips and then weaving them densely, horizontally. Rather than completely escape the Utsuwa, Nagakura here used it upside down. That would normally be the bottom of the basket, but he's made it the top. Uh, for a style of monumental figural sculpture that broke free of received ideas about the nature of craft, and I think also reminds us a little bit of Henry Moore. Now, this piece, one of our, one of our poster boys for the show, is by Honda Shoryu, uh, who uh, took inspiration from Sean Oshonsai, the, the great sort of founder of Oita basketry we saw earlier. And he's gone on to develop a sculptural language that really is his and his, and his alone. This piece called Shadow uh, dates from 2005, a few years after he, Honda, had struggled with the bursting of Japan's bubbled economy in the 80s and 90s and was rescued thanks to the support of American patrons, including Lloyd Coatesen. It's executed in twining, a staple basketry technique found all around the world, with bundles of up to five horizontal bamboo strips wound around the thin uh, thin vertical strips. Well, originally they were vertical because he started off by creating this as if it was going to be a basket, albeit a basket without a base. Having reached that stage, uh, Honda softened the entire piece in hot water and kneaded it into shape, turning it into the, the, the ring that you see here, and also pulling up some of the rows to form the varying gaps seen in the finished work. It's a fantastically intricate process that, that in the end produces this wonderfully free and spontaneous looking piece. The loose ends of the verticals were then, then plaited and secured with rattan and the whole piece was dyed in a range of warm tones and then lacquered both for stability when it set and for protection to keep the, to keep the, the bamboo uh, free of finger marks and dust and to preserve its, quality, its, its color. Honda himself, who's had a, a, a difficult and turbulent life, uh, 
describes these, immaculate, these immaculately executed baskets as exploded, the sculptures, I'm sorry, as explode, exploded baskets or explosions of the spirit. Kawashima Shigeo, another graduate of the Oita Bamboo Center, taught plaiting schools and made baskets for the wholesale market, but he soon tired of mass production. And while feeling a powerful affinity for bamboo, he was also irked by the material. Reminds you of someone else? A frustration he shared more than a century, shared more than a century ago by Rokansai, who, who will, you will remember once said that for a time. He hated bamboo. Realizing that he too could not run away from bamboo, Kamashima came up with a different solution. He addressed the problem by searching for a way of working that avoided what he called, I quote, the process of preparing and weaving bamboo that requires meticulous attention and endurance. So now describing his work in a different way and calling it rittai, which means three-dimensional, or even take arto, bamboo art. Since 1992, he's taken bamboo into new artistic realms that connect with worldwide sculptural trends and has become best known for large, transparent, outdoor sculptural installations created by attaching bamboo to itself instead of weaving it. So using two materials, he, the, the bamboo, bamboo is attached to itself by these myriad little um, string ties. All of, the, all of his works, as well as the miniature version illustrated here, are built in this way. Much of the larger pieces, of the larger work has been created for uh, overseas locations, particularly in the US, including one uh, on one occasion outside the Kennedy Center in DC. But this is a more recent example of his large-scale construction uh, dating. Uh, it's, it was located uh, quite near his native town of Beppu in Oita. Whether it's still there or not, I don't know. But on the whole, his outdoor work is intended to be uh, you know, there for as long as it survives. So the, the, the indoor miniature work is his, is, will be his, um, his long-term legacy to us. Now, Monden Kogyoku, those dates are not, not incorrect. He died in November 2021 20, at the age of 105 and was active practically until his last few months. He's played a highly influential role in the world of Japanese bamboo art for nearly 80 years. He started off in 1936, would you believe? But after World War II, the market for his high quality flower baskets collapsed. And for a long time, he supported his young family by mass producing thousands of inexpensive bamboo utensils. It wasn't until 1972, so that's 36, years after the start of his career and with the war intervening, that a local department store manager rediscovered his earlier, more artistic work. We shouldn't forget the role of departmental stores in Japan in promoting bamboo art and indeed the crafts in general. It's a, quite a unique situation in, uh, in that country. And this discovery was a development that soon led to his acceptance into the official exhibition world. Before long, he'd started cr to create these innov innovative basket sculptures that won him many, many admirers, both inside and outside Japan. Even into his 10th decade, he continued to find new ways of combining texture, shape, and color to create vari variations on the bird's nest concept that has characterized much of his practice over the past half century. As with other artists we've seen, like Nagakura and Minora, just shown, the starting point here, if you look carefully, is, a conven is conventional. There's a plaited base executed in wide strips of pale leached bamboo. Radiating elements of the same material, joined and reinforced by passages of twining or mat plaiting, create a framework for the artist's signature writhing, undulating, ro uh, rolling weave technique using very, fine, cut, very finely cut stained bamboo strips. I was able to appreciate the same approach when I was let loose in the stores of this museum uh, 18 months ago in an earlier work by Monden and playing with my new phone and its camera. Uh, I was able to peer inside this work where uh, if, if you get in there and luckily we had a blue material in the background, it reveals an almost architectural grandeur in its construction. But you can see the, that strict discipline formality uh, underpins the, the more creative freedom of the outside. 
Now, as in traditional ceramic dynasties, so in bamboo, those individuals who are lucky enough to be located just outside the usually male line sometimes enjoy more freedom to experiment than their relatives. Here's an example on the left by Tanabe Mitsuko, uh, who was the wife of the third Chikuwansai, the, 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 the grandson of the artist whose work we saw in the first slide. Somehow finding the time between child rearing and domestic commitments to learn the elements of bamboo craft, both from her husband and from her father-in-law, she's built a national and international reputation with her mysterious atmospheric sculptures, typically executed in a mixture of twining and conventional plaiting that we say, see here, and often made up of a group of conjoined pointed forms with lines that may reflect on tragic events such as the 1995 and 2011 earthquakes, respectively in Kobe and in northeastern Japan, or more personal episodes such as her own recovery from serious illness. Or sometimes they can take the form of the, uh, the mountains of Cappadocia in Turkey. And this is the, on the right is the work of her brother-in-law, the brother of the third Tanabe, again outside the main line and with the freedom to work in a somewhat different way. So that brings us to the end of our look at bamboo in the strict sense. But of course, we have a work by this wonderful artist I've just admired for so long, and I was just very, very lucky to show her work at Japan Society in one of the last shows that I did there in uh, 2011, where unfortunately on the return journey it got damaged, but that's a long story. She's not a bamboo artist, of course, but she's the master of another plant product, jute. It's a soft, shiny material with long strands, generally spun into coarse, strong baskets to make goods such as sustainable packaging or rope, or in the old days, sacks for all sorts of things. She exclusively makes these soft sculptures that range from smaller scales like, smaller scale pieces like this from Gary and Lawn's collection, uh, sometimes built up into room size interventions like the one you see on the right. And this is pretty unambitious for her. She's done ones that can actually fill an entire quite large church uh, in Western Europe. Not, not with the cubes, but with, with another form. Her work is instantly recognizable for its feather-like airy appearance, its transparency, its, its incredible precision of form, its intricacy of detail, its mellow but luminous coloration, and subtle interaction, interaction with its surrounding space. Features which, of course, it shares very much with uh, much conventional actual bamboo art. And like many contemporary Japanese artists, particularly female artists who work in ceramic and bamboo, Sereno pays tribute to the inspiration that she draws from the natural world and her home on the coast in Kyushu. Her success in elevating a humble, endlessly renewable material, bamboo is renewable as well, into a medium for serious sculpture also conveys, I think, a powerful environmental message. Now we'll race on to the subject of clay. Japanese ceramics, a field of art so familiar and popular here in the United States that no fewer than three exhibitions with Japanese ceramics at their heart are opening in this country over the coming nine days. Would you believe it? Perhaps when we think of traditional Japanese pots, this is just the first thing I found online, the kind of things to my, that comes to mind are objects like these, products of the so-called six old kilns, six old medieval kilns, there are many more than six, but that's the traditional expression, that produce stoneware vessels admired today for their rugged forms and their subtle finishes that owe a lot of their, a lot of their aesthetic appeal to patches of incidental glazing caused by accumulations of flying wood. Of course, this looks exercised a vast influence on the world of ceramics for around a century. We can see it in works by British artist Gareth Mason in the present exhibition. And the most prominent American example is the one you see here, who actually used a wood-fired Japanese-style kiln for the last 23 years of his career. Following a major rediscovery of Japan's medieval ceramics in the pre-war period, they took on a new life in the post-war era. I was thrilled to discover this piece in Gary and Lorne's collection uh, by an artist whose work I had not encountered before. 
He's based in Bizen, like the old pot we saw two slides ago, and is among, which is among the most revered of all the country's historic ceramic production centers. Already by the late 15th century, Bizen's rugged forms and austere surfaces attracted the attention of leading members of the cultural elite who were laying the foundations of Chanoyu, what we call the tea ceremony, that style of uh, formal tea drinking that's played such a key role in Japanese society and culture for the last half millennium. Some 20th and 21st century Bizen wares are more or less imitations of old pieces and don't interest me that much. But Yokoyama Naoki, who set up on his own in the year 2000, stands out among a group of younger artists who've taken the, this time-honored tradition in exciting new directions. No longer with access to the best Bizen clay because it's just worked out. It's not an inexhaustible resource. Um, he selects clay that's rich in inclusions, in other words, impurities, and often um, has a naturally marbled appearance and creates these large, bold forms. In this case, uh, much more precise than a, a, a typical traditional Bizen form. And, and he creates these works that display striking firing effects with gray or even black scorch marks contrasting with the ochre-colored clay. Of course, uh, he leaves less to chance than his, his um, predecessors. One feels that Murata Juko, a founding father of Ch Chanoyu 500 years ago, would have found in the work of this artist something of the, what he called the chilled and weathered, chilled and weathered in other words, the sabi, what we call sabi, the hie karuru aesthetic that he so admired in the Bizen wares of his, of his own day. I think Murata would have, would have been pleased to see that uh, 500 years after his own time, this sort of work was being produced. Now, Higashida Shigemasa is another leading contemporary potter, specializing in classic ceramic styles, but here uh, associated with the tea ceremony again. But in this case, it's the much more flamboyant oribe ware, known for its distinctive copper green glaze. But as we can see when his work is shown along um, a side of a, a set of beautiful little serving cups from the, from the John Weber collection made 400 years earlier. Um, his work actually bears, apart from the, the green glaze, it bears scant resemblance to any known Oribe original. He regards older wares as distillations of a traditional Japanese craft philosophy that treats irregularities and deformities not as defects, but as manifestations of unseen forces creating desirable effects that artists should not, should not attempt to control. And in his case, um, he likes to reflect the essence of the local clay and still more to recall the spirit of samurai leaders taking tea before going into battle because the development of the tea ceremony took place during the, one of the most warlike 50 years in the whole of Japanese history. And the tea ceremony is a kind of a moment of respite from that war, but also um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment when the words that you use often can reflect the sort of martial spirit of the patrons of the ceremony. We can see the same process here in the work of Kohara Yasuhiro, in this case with a focus on stoneware from Shigaraki, uh, another important ancient stone complex near Kyoto. Nishihata Tadashi, is another of these artists based in an old, old uh, stoneware center, in this case, Tamba, where ash clay stoneware has been made for at least eight centuries. Like other ancient kilns, Tamba ware has often depended for its aesthetic effects, though these are, often these are mostly appreciated by later connoisseurs rather than the original makers, on chance kiln events. In medieval Tamba ware, for example, on the right here, burning fragments of the wood used, to, used to, the fuel wood for the kiln, circulated at a high temperature and settled on the shoulders of large jars, forming splashes of glaze that reached down to the sides. For his more recent work, Nishihata on the left has taken his inspiration from this heritage, but instead of relying solely on flying ash, he makes his own green and bluish gray glazes from rice straw and burnt wood and applies them to the surface of his large vessels prior to firing. So there's some accident here, but not nearly as much as in a traditional piece. And his approach to glaze results 
in vases that boldly transcend the contemporary Japanese debate concerning functionality versus sculptural form. It is, it is a functional vase. You could display flowers in it, but it's also a sculpture. In addition, the part planned and part random surface effects that he achieves um, um, are in pursuit of his goal of using clay art to evoke the water, the forests, and the peaks of his native region uh, to the north of Kyoto. So away now from porcelain and the world of the old kilns to another tradition, uh, sorry, away from the stoneware and the work of the old kilns to another tradition, porcelain. Uh, obviously a Chinese invention, but one that's been known in Japan for about 400 years. This is not in the collection on view in the exhibition, but it's an example of the work of Fukami Sueharu, who is one of the most prominent revivers of porcelain uh, in Kyoto today. And he creates these works by um, pressure, uh, using a, a pressure process to inject porcelain into molds. Uh, the, the mold, after the porcelain has dried, the mold, is, the mold is taken apart, the piece is released, and then very carefully polished, and then given this extraordinarily subtle Chinese-derived um, pale blue-gray glaze. Inspired by this, a much younger artist, Kino Satoshi, who is definitely becoming something of a superstar in his own right, uh, has created another way of dealing with porcelain to create something completely modern. And interestingly enough, he uses, he's using the wheel, but he's sort of using the wheel and denying the wheel. He's not, make, he's not using the wheel to make a vessel, he's using it to make a sort of ribbon. First of all, he throws a thin ring of porcelain clay, then he cuts that ring into pieces and uses the centrifugal, centrifugal force of the wheel a second time, stretching out piece, each piece into a long curving ribbon, which he painstakingly dries, sands, and fires, and then gives this extraordinary glaze. So popular has, have his explorations of the relationship between natural phenomena and their surrounding spaces, as you see here, become even outside Japan, that an, an unauthorized version of his work with the unintended, uh, titled with unintended irony, Fairness, Justice, and Harmony, <laughs> was recently executed in polished steel and displayed outside a, uh, a public building in the city of Kaohsiung, south of Taiwan, where he just had an exhibition. This prompted a legal challenge by Kino, and the, the city authorities assembled an expert, I use the expression expert in quotation marks, committee to examine the matter. Three members directly determined that it was plagiarism, while the other five absurdly opined that more substantial investigative powers were needed. But, of course, the other thing about this is that when, when it's reproduced in stainless steel, it's kind of just a piece of public art and the wonderful glazed subtlety is completely lost. But that it's a piece of plagiarism, I think, is beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, all the remaining works in the Lasseter Ferraro collection under the microscope today are by female artists, reflecting not only Lorne and Gary's personal choices, but also the growing role played by women in the contemporary Japanese ceramic scene. And in today's art colleges, I don't know the exact statistic, but uh, in the ceramics department, women substantially outnumber men. Writing in the introduction to the catalogue for an exhibition on that theme set to open at the Art Institute of Chicago next Saturday, that's my commercial, um, I suggested four themes that characterize a lot of uh, contemporary female Japanese ceramic art. Emulator, emulation of nature, body art, the sodeisha, we'll come to that, and the creepy and the grotesque and the fleshy. There's four dominant categories in the practice of today's women ceramic artists. So starting with emulation of nature, there's a fabulous piece on the right, it's from the collection. The left is an earlier piece, just to show her evolution. Uh, Fuji no Sachiko, focused during the early part of her career on large part powerfully modeled sculptors ref that reflected the influence of local avant-garde fine art movements like um, Gutai, some of you may have heard of. Over time, however, she's moved to a softer style that more fully expresses her affinity for the supp suppleness 
and fragility of clay and her appreciation of plant form. Once she's satisfied that a piece has reached its final shape, she first allows it to dry, then uses a tool resembling an airbrush to coat its surfaces with a thin mixture of clay and water prior to firing. This imparts a sense of depth and abstraction, encouraging viewers to experience her works as non-representational sculptures, non-representational sculptures rather than mere literal models of, flower, of flowers. Body art. This is by an artist who spent almost her entire career uh, living in or near Paris, uh, a, a long-term change of residence that I think uh, has allowed Yoshimura to escape the straits, like some of the constraints of Japan's still very often male-dominated ceramic world, although that's changing pretty quickly, as I suggested a moment ago. Her sculptures are made from stoneware clay, sometimes, as here, enhanced with glazes applied to the interior and fragments of pre pre-fired white porcelain embodied in the still wet body. Initially formed on the wheel, but then further manipulated, since another artist using the wheel but denying the wheel, they're fired at high temperatures that produce charred geologic or tree-like surfaces with burst cracks and other semi-accidental surface effects, somewhat like those we've, what we saw in medieval stoneware vessels. And she regards these as gifts, I quote again, gifts from the kiln. This expression of a desire to draw out the power that lies within the clay is enhanced by a powerful sensuality or eroticism as well, expressed in curvaceous exteriors and dark, lush interiors that goes far beyond the conventions of the stoneware tradition. Natural forms again. Even as a student, <coughs> Koike Shoko, uh, had clear preferences. She admired Japan's post-war pioneering artists and was inspired by international contemporary art uh, and, and questioned or eventually abandoned vessel form, instead creating ceramic sculptures. It wasn't until the 1990s, however, 30 years after she started out, that she found time to develop the hand-sculpted, shell-like forms with seamlessly fitted lids that have earned her a global reputation. The ridge patterns that characterize much of her work, perhaps suggestive of ocean waves or the strata of seaside cliffs, trace their origins to a single moment 40 years ago when she was eating a sazae, a turban shell, and thought of trying to emulate the profile of its shell on the outside of a bowl. Ogawa Machiko's practice reflects a, time, a lifetime of engagement with unfamiliar cultures and a mindset absolutely free from traditional constraints. At Tokyo University of the Arts, she studied under illustrious ceramic masters, but learned more by looking at Japan's very earliest pottery, long before the pieces we've looked at today. She later became fascinated by mineral specimens during a stay in Paris, uh, and then spent three and a half years in West Africa, living close to the local people and adapting to the searing heat and basic subsistence diet. Ogawa's built a global reputation by formulating and combining clays with different characteristics, making work that evokes her lived experience of direct contact with nature at its most extreme. Now, I've made several references to the post-war, immediate post-war Japanese ceramic scene, the avant-garde, and the Sodesha, whose founding member was Yagi Kazuo, whose work we see here. I wanted to introduce the most famous work by that group because he was really in the vanguard of those who yearned to throw off the shackles of both organizational and creative convention. Taking inspiration from such artists as the Japanese-American sculptor uh, Isamu Noguchi and Miro Picasso Clay, in 1954, Yagi stunned the Kyoto ceramic world with Mr. Zamza's walk taking its theme from the, the novel, Metamorphosis, by Kafka, an abstract piece assembled from wheel-thrown, irregular pipe-shaped elements, again using the wheel to deny the wheel. This was a key moment in, radical, in a radical transition from wheel-based vessel making to hand-built sculpture, from functional to non-functional. We're nearly there, and we're, going to, we're just going to run over by a minute or two. So, taking her inspiration from Yagi, uh, another of our, our poster girl, Tanaka Yu, 
has lately developed a, a global reputation with her bag pieces, ceramic models of cloth wrappers that leave viewers guessing what exactly they might contain. She selects a bowl, or in this case, perhaps a wooden storage box, and wraps it in a foroshiki, a square of cloth traditionally used in Japan to transport and deliver everyday, everyday goods. With the wrapped object serving as her model, she carefully makes a copy in clay, using the coil building technique to replicate every fold, tuck, and wrinkle, and adding temporary supports to stop the clay from losing its shape before it's firm and dry. It's a beautiful and beguiling piece of work, but conceptually speaking, it can be seen as a novel take on Yagi's ceramic philosophy. Echoing his advocacy of a transition from wheel-based vessel making to hand-built sculpture, from functional to non-functional, Tanaka's Foroshiki literally and deliberately serves no practical purpose. So in this way, it gives visual form to one of the key moments in post-war Japanese ceramics. Now looking to the future, I'd like to introduce two works from my category of the creepy, the grotesque, the fleshy, the expressive, the future. Both are by younger Japanese women artists, and neither is from the collection we're celebrating today. But who knows? These are powerful markers of current trends, and perhaps pieces like this might, in the not, distant, not too distant future, find a home in the elegant galleries of the Mint. Kawaura Saki shares a preference for the otherworldly and bizarre seen elsewhere in contemporary Japanese ceramic art by younger women. Like most of her work, this piece is finished in a version of Oxblood Red, a glaze developed in 18th century China as a substitute for another one that had been lost and applied to imperial wares used for blood sacrifice. An appropriate origin enough for a glaze applied to a contemporary work that evokes the appearance of an animal or perhaps a human heart. Yamaguchi Mio was drawn to clay at art college as a way of achieving her own artistic goals because, I quote, you, can't touch it directly, you can touch it directly with your hands without tools getting in the way. She's unusually explicit about the communicative intent of her practice. For me, handling clay can seem like a way to process my feelings. Frustration, anxiety, conflict, contradiction, liberation, elation, even if they're hard to put in the words. Discussing this particular work, Yamaguchi has explained that Shura is a Buddhist deity. In Japanese, the word is used to express intense emotions. When I created the piece, I had big, strong emotions. I wove these emotions into the clay. I think this introduction of emotion into ceramic art is a new thing in Japan. These are inspiring works. They're more art, perhaps, than ceramic art. And perhaps some of them, particularly the heart, might not be so easy to live with sometimes more challenging than beautiful, but they do offer exciting new vistas for Japanese ceramics, regardless of gender, in the coming decades of the 21st century, and of course, the coming decades of this museum. Thank you. Thank you.